I got the ad. <clears throat> All right, folks, welcome to Table Talks, episode six. As usual, I am here. My name is Crush from Points. Joining me today is Toxic, the uh, majestic worker of the board, and the special guest, Katie. Arms on Tumblr to talk to about uh, props, using props at the table, using props with your players, and making the best game you can with uh, tacti tactile, tangible experience. With that being said, Katie, I'll kick it off to you, uh, and uh, let's hear uh, what you have to bring. All right. Um, I do a lot of props for the table just because I enjoy making things. I'm the artist of our group, so. Yeah, I like having a physical thing at the table to throw at my players when uh, I have it available. Uh, not sure what other kinds of introduction we want to do for this, because props are pretty straightforward. It's a physical <laughs> thing. Here, have it. Have fun. What are some things that you've uh, brought to your tables? Um, the most recent one I made, which is on my Tumblr, is the official Indigo Pokemon League handbook. Uh, the contents were written by... Rashiko, based on an 1880s boxing handbook, which was like boxing, clubbing, and other manly sports. So it's appropriately old-timey and ridiculous and honorable, which seems fitting for this version of our Pokemon world. Um, I dyed it, and I covered it in disgusting grit, and I sewed it together, and it's actually just a full handbook thing. As you can see here, those are the pages drying. But it's, it's a fun thing to have at the table. It's an actual physical document. It's a thing you can read. It's an in-world document, which I always think are really fun. Because, like, providing summaries of things is one thing, but having an actual physical thing that this is what your characters find, this is what they read, I think makes for a better experience. So th when it comes to... Um, actually, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, other props that uh, you might have done, if, when, is it all a matter of uh, here's something I think will help the narrative, here's something I help, think will help the story, or have you ever had a prop that uh, was more for uh, mechanical experience? I tend to do mostly narrative-based ones, um, just providing more world background, providing in-game benefits, I guess, because like I did... Got this one over here. Uh, the players never ended up getting this because yeah. they didn't talk to the right people, but they were in a labyrinth, and I made... Um, somebody was doing a map of the labyrinth. I was going to have given them simplified versions of my maps. So, they're all dyed and nice, but... <laughs> they would have had these, but they didn't. So, there's that. Because um, that can, can provide an in-game benefit, but it's still... Like a thing to have at the table and a thing for them to reference, especially with something like a labyrinth that's really hard to keep track of. Um, other things I've made, um, I'll do plot hooks, which for my old D and D game when I was running Fourth Ed, I had a character whose background was a bounty hunter, so I was constantly giving the character their bounties. Uh, this one was not actually from the organization that they worked for, but it was sealed in wax, so that's fun, and had a very basic. Here's the people you were supposed to kill on it. <laughs> uh, the ones that they were getting from the government had a full seal on the corner. They would give more detailed information, like this is what this person does, this is what they look like, this is what their abilities are. Uh, this one has a slight seal. I don't know if you can see it because it's from like an assassin guild. So they had that. Um, other things, we had a character lose his memory because he was too busy getting a hundred souls put into his head from a ritual going wrong. So there was an old journal of his shaman leader, which this one was for goblins, so it's little. Small size. <laughs> and this was just his actual uh, stuff that the shaman was writing about, which was mostly like, wow, this goblin, he's dabbling in dark things. And there are also druids here that might be killing us soon, which, spoilers, they did. <laughs> Um, having a map at the table, I think, is a really good idea, just in general. I mean, sometimes your players get a hand, a hold of a campaign world map. It's good to point at for knowing where things are. On that idea, when you're using props and you have something to hand to your players, is, do you see, find that it makes them more interested in the game, or does it sort of distract them? Um, I found it makes them more interested. I mean, it can be a distraction depending on what the prop is. I mean, if it's really fun to play with, somebody's going to get distracted by it. But generally, so long as... Is this still going? I just saw a lost signal thing. We're good. Okay, we're good. All right. Uh, generally, 
if there's a it's a prop that actually benefits them like a map gives them information a journal it might take people time to read but for the people who do go out and read it there's benefits in the quest because they know what's going on so i've generally found them to be more advantageous than dis disadvantageous but it's really a matter of whether they want to interact with it or not when i'm using props in all of my games i tend to use props in a way to make the game harder uh, the I so the one of the uh, things I used in Shadowrun was I made a contract for one of my players. The story is, the shortest uh, way that I can tell this story is that he had uh, a very stupid idea where he would wanted to um, try and argue with the corporation. So uh, for that reason, I told him, "All right, uh, now you're more or less in indentured servitude or in slavery to this corporation. You're you're now a slave." But to get out of it, because I never really believe in uh, forcing a player into doing something, I gave him this contract that was literally 500 pages long, double sided, that had nothing but gibberish on it, with six words spliced into the uh, into the. Um, <sighs> Six. Six words placed into the... It was like A's that were capital and A's that were lowercase, like all over the place. And if he found all six words before the campaign was... I'm sorry, the session was over, he would be able to find his way out of the contract. And he actually okay. did. Uh, That's he, a nice abstraction, too. <laughs> it was cool. It was a, it was a way, uh, if you're using that prop, to give him something like, all right, you messed up, here's your punishment. But one, you can get out of it, and two, you have to get out of it while playing the game. So if you were, uh, they had to run a heist at the same time. So if he was busy paying attention to his contract but could not um, uh, accomplish his mission, you know, he's uh, still detracting from the party's ability to progress. Uh, something else I did, again, to make the game harder, because that's more or less what I do, this is Corruption Points, was uh, the uh, Dread Tower. Um, Dread is a game based on Jenga. Right, uh, where every time you um, take an action that would not normally be possible by human means, you have to pull a Jenga block. So to make this even harder, I painted my Jenga tower black and then lit uh, oil lanterns around it. It's a horror game. I wanted to like really uh, hone in on that idea of horror. And then after every hour of play that went by, I would turn off an oil lantern. It's making it it's to the point where they had to pull a black Jenga tower in the complete darkness. And while it was mostly the hardest thing I've ever done to my players. Not a single one of them knocked over the Jenga tower. That's impressive. I, I know, it was amazing. I can't play Jenga normally. I, I get to like the fifth pole and I just smack that thing down. And they were literally in the darkness pulling black bricks from this thing and stacking them on top. It was awesome. That's really cool. So I find that myself, I use my... Uh, my, all of my props to make the game uh, mechanically harder, whereas the narrative sort of is the same. Whereas you use your props to be narratively uh, more interesting, but the mechanics stay the same. Uh, in that idea, when you give your players these narrative props, how do they normally react? Is it usually a positive thing, or do they uh, is do they feel as if it's something they're just doing to do? Um, generally, I'd say it's a positive response. But, again, it depends on the player whether they're interested in it or not. Because the ones that are interested in it will get a benefit out of it. The ones who don't care will just ignore it. So, that's, tip that's hit or miss. Yeah. <laughs> that's player logic. Yeah. In that idea, um, when I'm giving my players this uh, all these mechanical props, I, I find that if I have to use it in the game, if they have to use it with the game, they can't ignore it, obviously. It's part of the game. And in that idea, I don't ever find myself making a prop that players don't use. They literally have to be using them to be playing. Um, has there ever been a time when you've had something that you really, really excited, like the maps, for example, where you're really excited to use this thing, and the players either skip it, pass over it, miss it? Uh, how do you how do you deal with that as a GM? Um, I just get over it. I mean, like while some of the props I w had would have made things more interesting or would have been an interesting puzzle to solve, they're not absolutely crucial. Ideally, it would be really sweet if I could get ones that are more mechanical, but the kinds of stuff that I make just tend to be like, hey, look, world building, check it out. So more immersion for me, because that's what I get into as a GM is a bit of the world building. So very cool. Very cool. Uh, has now I want to talk about um, props going bad. Uh, if 
as a player, um, when you're, when as a GM rather, when you have this like five page narrative about this boss, he's going to be awesome. He's going to tell them their like the entire backstory and his nefarious plan and all these things. And then the players decide to walk in and shoot him in the face. And you're like, oh, you didn't want to. Okay, just flip, flip. The the idea that uh, I think most GMs have a problem with is coming to that with props. Here's all this money I've spent. Here's all this time I've spent making these things. And now my players are completely ignoring them, much like they do my notes. Um, what would you say to a GM that has not used props and is wary of doing it? Um, I'd say go for it. I mean, there's always some kind of immersion that's going to come from bringing a physical thing to the table. And whether they ignore it or not, um, it gives them an opportunity and then maybe they'll get a chance. Like, here's a prop that my players didn't care about super lots. I thought it was cool. It would have given them some more information. But I had a character who was playing cards with them the night before. Grant them this box. It's a very simple looking box. Inside this box are some cards. Um, these, this group was on a pioneering mission. And so they were going out into the Wild East time because it was flavored like the Wild West, but it's the Wild East on the map. And they had these cards. These ones were fairly disgusting, but there were four of them and I had just given them four shovels which, it was a pretty straightforward you're probably not going to be doing well by getting this far, but the other cards in the box were supposed to be a clue as to the composition of their opposing pioneer party but no one really got into that too far and that campaign has since ceased, but I think there was an opportunity there, it was a little bit by the wayside, but I still thought it was cool, and it was still worth my effort, I think, because I still had fun doing it. Whether the players <laughs> use it or not, I mean, it's about the GM having fun, too. There you go. Yeah, we we are all part of the game, you know? It's it's not just a matter of the players having fun, but the group should be having the most fun they can possibly have, uh, which is something that I think a lot of people forget. The Have you ever had uh, the advantage or the uh, opportunity to use props in a combat situation? Um... Not so much, but you could. I mean, some physical things make it a little easier to explain what's going on. Like, this is not a prop that I made, but a potion bottle. A lot of people will argue that a potion bottle might be a free action, but this is not going to take me... It's not even close to six seconds. <laughs> but that's not a free action. And if somebody wants to argue with me, I'm going to pull out that potion bottle and tell them, do this as a free action. <laughs> It's a minor. It's got to be a minor. <laughs> no, it's, it is a move and a standard. Thank you very much. Because it is a move to pop off that thing and a standard to chug that. Because I was not paying attention to this live stream while I was drinking that. And I'm pretty sure it's leaking on my couch right now, actually. But <laughs> So, uh, to drag Toxic into this conversation, I um, sometimes use miniatures to uh, to showcase um, uh, positions on the board. Especially with D&D, &D, especially 4th edition. 4th uh, edition has the advantage of actually measuring movement in school squares in the way that they really want you to buy their tile sets. Uh, I happen to have a mat. But for games that are less um, specific about squares per distance, is it possible to use miniatures for a combat situation, and do they help the game? Um, is, this, is that me? Well, <laughs> it is you! Okay, now I gotta, like I gotta to think of stuff. I've been, I've been just out of it for now. Um... <laughs> Uh, no, I'll take it first. Let's take it first. I'll kick it back to you. Um, <laughs> so when I'm when I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons, when I'm playing um, that kind of game, it's a lot to do with where you're standing and how you're standing on it. Uh, flanking is a big deal. Spe seeing that you are um, on different sides of an enemy gives you combat advantage. Gives you that plus two. Uh, I often like to make my encounters, my rooms where fights are going to happen, interesting in themselves. I find sitting in a square where the enemies are on one side and you're on the other side, that Civil War sort of like stand and shoot model is really, really boring. Uh, I don't like to have dudes with guns on one side and bad dudes with guns on the other side. In that idea, I try to make the whole room either something you can interact with or dangerous in one way or another. And the best way to show PCs that, you know, if you're standing here, you're going to get hit is by having that kind of, uh, not so much a prop, but a miniature. You know where you are, you can see where everyone else is, you can see where the enemies are. And it's important that, to have that. Um, but uh, a lot of games don't really have their own set miniatures. I often end up using the Space Marines for mostly everybody. <laughs> Space Marines and Necrons, Necrons would be bad guys. Um, but in, in the idea that there are games that do not have you know set miniatures, do not have movement in squares, 
do you think it's possible to use miniatures in a way to represent your person, or does it take away from the game? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I've tried to to add miniatures in for games that you know don't use squares and and stuff like that. But the biggest problem that I f I find that I have is that everyone has an idea of how their character looks in their head. Uh, everyone has an idea of how other people's characters kind of look in their head. And I find that miniatures kind of take away from that because you're never going to, like you said, like, you know, you use Space Marines and Necrons. And, it, <laughs> and no matter how hard you try, you're never going to get a model that looks like your character. And, and that's, that's my problem, my biggest problem with using the models. I mean, I was using tokens in in the only game that I've played with miniatures was, you know, just tokens. And they and just, I think I was, like, playing a Tauren and uh, my token was a dwarf, so... <laughs> 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 It kind of took away a little bit, though. Yeah, a lot of the um, a lot of the ideas that. Oh, I'm sorry, Katie. Go ahead. Do you want to jump? Yeah, in? um, because it's really about having an idea of relative placement at the table. Because I mean, it doesn't have to be a perfect one-to-one -one ratio of like what your character looks like to what their miniature looks like. Because the point of the mat is to have some sort of visual component to figuring out where everybody is laid out. And I mean, like I use beads a lot. Let's see if you can get a look at these. I mean, they're pretty basic. I mean, somebody represents blue, somebody represents green, whatever. Here's beige number one, here's beige number two that you guys are fighting. Because, I mean, having even a relative map, whether you're, or not you're on a grid or not, helps a lot more than everybody kind of trying to decide, well, I think I'm about 30 feet that way, but I'm not quite sure how far the dragon can shoot lightning at me. I mean, like, while the map helps for giving a mechanical, this is exactly how far away you are, I mean, even just having a basic thing for relative location can help, as opposed to just all in imagination space. Yeah, and I think there's I think there's room for both, and I think it really depends on the encounter. Uh, when I was playing Dark Heresy, and there was a hotel room for a very specific, very general uh, idea of an encounter. There was a hotel room and an ambush set up in the adjacent hotel room, and the idea was the players are going to walk in, not know there's an ambush, and then a grenade flies through the wall. And my, I wanted that to be uh, like sort of a surprise, and then because it's a hotel room, I don't have any idea what furniture is in there or how they've um, how they interact with that furniture. But I wanted them to be able to stunt in whatever they want to do. Like one guy kicked over the bed and used it as cover. Another guy like ran into the little kitchen dinette set and like used like the fridge door and stuff like that. You know, where I didn't have a physical representation of what was in there, but I allowed them to do it. And on the flip side. Uh, there are encounters where I do have physical representations of everything, and I want them to use it in a specific way. Uh, where uh, if you're in a mine shaft and there's certain uh, rock that lights on fire really easily, a certain ore that uh, lights on fire really easily, and there's torches everywhere, you know, how do you grab the torch and run over there and then throw it at an enemy or something like that? Uh, I think there's something to be said about both ways, either using imagination space and using encounter space. But it depends on the kind of combat that you are looking for. The kind of I think encounter. it also depends on the combat environment, because like you were talking before, when you have an environment that you've presented and you have various aspects of the location that you want to integrate, it's different from like a hotel room, which has a standard layout, and most of the players are familiar with what a hotel room looks like, whereas your customized encounter location would not be as common of a language for them. Right. No, that's that's a great point. Yeah, the everyone knows what a hotel room is and what might be in it, but not everyone knows what an office building in the 26th century would be like. You know, <laughs> it's <laughs> it's very interesting. That's a great point. It's very interesting to sort of set up that kind of thing. And I know I've seen on Tumblr and uh, all over the place. Really, there's t people that use all sorts of different icons to uh, show their characters. Either they be uh, gen uh, little um, counters or uh, clear plastic triangles are a big thing. And sometimes the Reaper minis are fantastic. Um, Those are cool. I like them. <laughs> toxic the thing I wanted to bring up to you specifically: uh, if you had a group where everyone was uh, local, everyone was nearby, and you could um, give everyone the opportunity to buy a mini and paint it themselves, do you think that would make them attached to their character more, or do you think it would just be uh, more or less a waste of time for a small uh, uh, aspect of the game? Well, if I can, I just quickly go back to what we were saying before with the the grid and all that. Um, I find like when I'm GMing, I don't really want them to know the exact ranges, like, cause I don't, I, I figure like their character's not gonna know exactly how the how far the enemy's gonna shoot. But if I kind of give them a rough estimate, that's just how I like to work it, cause I don't I don't like to, to bring in too much mechanics and you know. Because then you the get that game. player who's counting out exactly thirty feet to see with if yeah, they're in point blank like, shot range or not. Yeah, and they get into the right spot, and yeah, it's 
Well, Rules fun. lawyers, but, um, the worst. <laughs> but yeah, getting back to your uh, question, yeah, I think it would um, add something if they if they're painting and if they're maybe converting a model even, you know, put put uh, putting some effort in. And uh, I think the smallest parts can actually bring a big part to the game. You know, it may may seem kind of small, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, I think it, I think it would add a lot. Yeah, I, I think there's something to be said about, you know, I really like uh, tabletop wargaming. I really like 40K. I really like War Machine. You know, and I think there's something to be said about sort of melding those two worlds, the modeling, painting aspects of um, tabletop wargaming and the, the imagination scape that is role-playing, tabletop role-playing. And I, I find that not a lot of games really do their best to lend to that. Um, D and D sort of does, but you still have to look for third party distributors of models to understand like what to make. And uh, the D and D miniatures actually is its own game, its own tabletop game. But I'm not—I've never met anyone that actually plays it. Uh, <laughs> so I, uh, there's a, the idea there that not making your character is one thing, but then painting your character and choosing what you look like is another. And I think that would actually really benefit the game. There's a lot of tools that help with that, though. One of the ones we used to use was Hero Machine, because when I'm too lazy to draw characters, there's a lot of, like, essentially doll-making templates that you could use to construct a general representation of what your character look, looks like. And I've had a GM that was using those to get an impression for NPCs. And there's a good Pokemon Trainer one we use for the Pokemon tabletop game, which the unfortunate problem with that one is everyone looks 10 <laughs> Which is really a big problem for when you're trying to like make Lieutenant Surge as a mini, and he looks ten. So you have to go in and paint and edit in a beard and hope that you can make him wide enough that it looks like he's big and burly and muscly. When that face shape says, "I'm a little boy." <laughs> With that being said, um, I want to bring on to uh, another topic. When I'm making uh, a finale. When I'm doing the last session of a campaign, um, maybe even the last session of a game, I like to go like go big or go home. I like to really blast it out. And uh, the one time that I did this for Dark Heresy was um, the 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 tank, <laughs> which uh, I think I've said enough so that everyone here knows what I'm talking about now. But it, I wanted to uh, actually have a tank that my players had to climb up. I wanted it to be a vertical, like awesome encounter where they started at the bottom and they got to the top and they killed that dude and they like won the game. But the tank would be filling up with more or less blood, and they could drown in it. Um, and like that was the I think that's the coolest time I've ever had with a prop. That being said, it took me five and a half hours to build this thing, uh, to go out buy all the things, uh, cut the wood, position it, glue everything together, nail some stuff, uh, glue the styrofoam blocks to the side of the tank, and we used it for about twenty, maybe thirty minutes. Uh, it was it's still up on the top ten of like things I've ever done uh, for tabletop gaming for myself and my players. But uh, when it comes to that kind of uh, end experience, when, uh, personally, I'll say yes, but I wanted to uh, throw it up to both of you. Do you think it's worth it to put that much time into making the last experience huge? Or do you think it, that that experience will always be huge because it's the last time you're doing it? I think absolutely. If you're going to turn it up to 11, turn it up to 11. I mean, I don't typically have, this is going to be the last session of the campaign because I don't have them as structured as you do, but... I mean, if you're going to have a session that's going to be big, make it as big as you can. Yeah, I mean, I, I give uh, give everyone props for, well, using props. But, uh, because, <laughs> I mean, the, the the biggest thing I've done is uh, I, I go like this when it's a shopkeeper. You know, just so they know they're talking to a shopkeeper. That, that That's the only thing I've done. I really don't use props. It's I just explain everything. <laughs> um, so... Uh, so yeah, but I mean, if I had the time, I, I, I would uh, I'd definitely want to do something like that. That looks amazing. And and I kind of want to do something like that now, uh, but all my players live in another country, so maybe I'll, maybe <laughs> I'll have to still, send them like, letters. If you do Skype stuff, I mean, you can still have physical things. Like, I mean, this flag, this is not for me as a GM. This was just to have. And like... I had a character who carried around a skull, and it's so much more interesting to be like, oh yeah, this is my cousin, than it is to actually just, like, give that description. I mean, it's one thing to see me interacting with it, and another to have me talking about interacting with it. <laughs> uh, all of that being said, um, actually, it brings us almost to the end of our show. The, uh, so the idea that we've all collectively come to is that props are great and use them. 
Uh, I think that's where we are. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to say to conclude, Katie, on um, making props, using props, uh, best ways to do it, and um, best way to start doing it? Um, best way to start doing it is come up with something you think would be cool for the players to actually have and interact with. Make it important, at least enough for them to care, and make it realistic. I don't know. I I have a lot of fun dyeing paper. It's a really simple way of making an aged-looking document. And the difference between this and a printer white sheet of paper is enough to make players go, wait a minute, that looks interesting. And if it's another thing to get your players like more engaged at the table, then go for it. All right, we, we contend with enough when it comes to distractions. I think dragging them in by having something they can play with is a good idea. Yeah, and I mean, like, you're going to fidget a lot at the table. We had a shapeshifter for a while that I was using a kneaded eraser, which was hit or miss because... On one hand, it's like, oh, cool, the shapeshifter can shift. And then on the other hand, they're making miniature Totoros for half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, it's a double-edged sword. You never know when a player is going to be more interested in the prop than the game. Yeah. Um, I'm running my thing over Skype, so all of my players have a computer in front of them. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> that makes it difficult. They have the internet at their fingertips, so, you know, destruction of plenty. You have no idea whether or not they're paying attention or what they're paying attention to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you making that face for? <laughs> All of that said, I think that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, so thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you so much for Katie coming on and Toxic manning the board. I do not know how to do this yet, so I really needed that. Uh, thanks for the technical help there. <laughs> Uh, Dice Troop it will always provide these videos for free, but we do take donations. It's on the Dice Troop uh, main site. You can talk to Fox about that. Also, you can view any of our tumblers for various uh, ideas on this. Literary Firearms is Katie's, and if you go to her props tag, she'll see all these things that we brought up. Uh, minus Corruption Points and Toxic is Toxic Painting. Uh, tactician Toxic. Yeah. Tactician Toxic. Ooh. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> And Toxic uh, has a, actually the uh, a way of painting miniatures if anyone has an idea of using that at their table and does not know how to use it. Uh, not how, know how to paint it or where to start. Toxic can definitely give you po uh, tips and pointers there. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, thanks for coming on and I'll see you all next week. Yep, thanks for watching.